Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dream Catcher Podcast, a place where your dreams can find a voice. Have you ever wondered what it really takes to come up with innovative and creative ideas? Do you have to just sit around and wait until you have a stroke of brilliance? Well, it turns out that that isn't the case. According to my guest today, Joe Garlington, we can develop a creative mindset with practice and by finding the right sources of inspiration. Joe, as the former vice president and creative lead of interactive projects at Walt Disney Imagineering, was responsible for the development of interactive attractions for Disney theme parks. Joe also led long-term visioning for Disney's Epcot theme park and played an important role in the development of new concepts for the theme park entertainment. Currently, Joe consults and teaches theme park design at the University of Southern California. In this interview, Joe pulls from his vast experience to share some important lessons on finding creative insight, including the best processes to follow and how we can tackle common obstacles that tend to get in the way. And if you found this information helpful, please don't forget to like, rate, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Thanks. Hi, Joe. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah, it's so wonderful to connect with you again. I so appreciate you making the time to share your knowledge with all of us. I'm more than happy to do it. You know, I I love talking about myself. I'm just a big ego hound. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, as you know, I'm a huge Disney and Disney Imagineering fan because I think they really are the gold standard when it comes to innovation and thinking outside the box. So I'm really excited to know more about your involvement in their projects and also about your other accomplishments outside of Disney. Some, yeah. I, I spent 25 years inside Disney, and so an awful lot of it was there, but I did some stuff on the outside as well. Right, right, yeah. Um, all right, so let's get into it, shall we, Joe? Sure. So tell me, what were your past experiences that led you to your work with Disney? When I left high school, I wanted to be a history major. Uh, that led me into anthropology, which led me to Africa, where I discovered that I wasn't going to be an anthropologist. <laughs> you have to be either more humble or more haughty than I was. You have to be humble enough to, you know, put on the grass skirt and go native, or <laughs> you have to be haughty enough to look at people, you know, under a microscope as if they were bugs, and I'm either that humble nor that haughty. So uh, I came back from Africa, however, having looked at a bunch of African art and kind of just set me going. Now, interestingly, it set me off on a funny track because while I was learning the basics, drawing and painting that stuff, I instantly became interested in what I called art that touches back. There had been an article in Art Forum about art that was, that art had become too precious and we wanted art that was more touchable. And they showed Henry Moore sculptures with kids climbing on them. And I thought, well, that's kind of a cheat, but, um, but if that was the, the movement now, then I'd already missed that one. What would be the next one would be art that touches back, which led me into interactivity. I happened to be at the University of Utah. My dad was a college professor there. And there was a guy there at the time, an ex-Harvard graduate. Um, oh, great, I'm going to forget his name. At any rate, he started uh, uh, an engineering program. And he, he is... Um, I'll, if I can remember his name, I'll bring it back up. But you know, he is the guy who first made a computer draw a picture. Uh, he is the father of computer graphics. And he founded a, an engineering program there, which was fabulous. And it brought in all sorts of interesting people, including Ed Catmull, who founded Pixar, um, uh, John Warnock, who founded uh, Adobe Systems, um, uh, Alan Kay, who, uh, who went on to... Um, Xerox Park ran Xerox Park. They're the ones who invented the user guest user interface, the whole idea of uh, graphical user icons so that if you have trash can on your desktop or files on your desktop, that all came out of that work. Uh, 
uh, Steve Jobs went and bought that whole group. And that's the reason that all came to Apple, for instance. So a bunch of very interesting people who were starting that. And among other things, he also invented the first head-mounted display. And I saw that clear back in the 70s. And, it, and that it just kind of got my mind going toward interesting, physically interactive stuff. I then went to CalArts, uh, built a bunch of that stuff, uh, got introduced to Disney and worked in the film industry a little bit, did the gopher for Caddyshack. That was probably the only thing anybody would remember. And then um, eventually came to Disney uh, and then spent 25 years in and out there. I had my own company briefly, but. Okay. Okay. So what was driving your passion all through this? Was there any particular um, vision that you had for yourself that. Yeah. Voyeurism. I'm fascinated with people, what they do and why they do it. And as a designer, I became interested uh, um, in sort of manipulating that. Right, um, uh, uh, and that's what game design and interactive design really is, is trying to create a bunch of lures and traps in a world uh, and then watching people explore that world and hopefully have fun and be entertained or educated by what they're doing. And so th th that's where it all started is initially just trying to understand what made people do why they do what they do and then trying to build worlds for them to have fun in. Right, right. So it's just uh, understanding people and what really drives them that kind of fuels your creator process. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And is there anything else that goes into how you come up with ideas um, and how much of it is art and how much of it is science? Well, ideation is, I, I think ideation starts with observation. Uh, for me, it, ideas almost always come out of um, a piece of observation of some sort or other. They're um, either um, uh, um, something, usually they come in two parts. Uh, one part of the observation will be um, creative and one part will be human, right? So, uh, Usually it's, it's something, so I'll change subject just slightly. As a side gig, I write songs. And the songs, and it's easier to explain creativity here. The songs almost always have a musical component and a lyrical component, right? And, it, and the lyrical, and they almost, to me, almost always come together, the, the, the core, right? And the observation is about something uh, that humans do, right? And then it comes with a an emotional context, which is what the music is. So when I was working at Disney, the observations often were based on what I observed guests doing in the park or not doing in the park that seemed kind of wacky. Um, so for instance, um, uh, I started uh, the work that led to the, vo the live voiced Mickey character. And it's now the technology that is used for the Star Wars characters, the walk arounds, right? When they talk to you. Oh, uh, the live Mickey character? Like where, where is that uh, in the theme park? He's not anywhere anymore, but for a while he was in Florida. Uh, they, they took him out as being too expensive, which just annoys the Jesus. Okay. Me, but um, yeah, um, because I remember, where did I see him? <laughs> no, it was, it was down there next to the old, ne next to Mr. Lincoln on Main Street in uh, okay. Magic Kingdom. But like I say, they took him out, oh, I don't know, by now, about a year ago. He was up there for several years, incredibly popular, but everything's based on measurements and the way they measure that stuff doesn't capture the difference between a, a non-speaking Mickey and a speaking Mickey and so yeah. is it similar to the animatronics that we see in the rides and some of the no 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 this is this allows for a live performer uh in a costume I mean if you look at what we call the rubber heads right the character costumes they tend to be quiet silent right Mickey doesn't ever say a word to you right. and Donald doesn't face characters do like if you go up and talk to Bell or Cinderella right you can have a conversation and yeah. so the 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 quality of the interaction is massively different right um, yeah. because in one you're and you actually look at watch how people behave and it's considerably different 
Yeah. Um, uh, uh, if you watch people with a costume character, a uh, uh, rubberhead, um, they generally treat the character as a prop. You'll hear the parents saying, okay, honey, talking to their children, okay, honey, now move over there, stand next to Mickey, mm -hmm. smile, all that kind of stuff. And Mickey's just standing there kind of moving around, but they yeah. treat him as a prop. They never address Mickey. Yeah, I mean, but they Where, have to use, they use their body a lot. It's all about the body language. And I think they do a pretty yeah, good job. Like, yeah. Oh, no, it's fabulous. And yeah. it's generally rated very highly. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, a little girl goes up to Belle, completely different. They look at each other in the face. Mm -hmm. They have a conversation. They talk about something meaningful to the child. It's just a qualitatively different thing. Absolutely. By measurement, they're identical because this flawed way that Disney measures stuff, right? Qual the quality of attractions. But, but anyway, what we wanted to do was for the rubberheads, we wanted to give them an ability to have that same kind of interaction. And we got there, but it's more expensive. And so they cut it. Out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I would imagine that teamwork is a huge part of working in uh, Disney Imagineering. So what was it like, the dynamics, when you were trying to come up with all these? Um, okay. well, well, we'll go back to this. So I, I didn't, so the, the basic idea for that came from a simple observation. Okay. Why do we, ha why do we have mm -hmm. silent era characters in the 21st century? Okay. That's why it makes no sense. So there was the observation. Once we had the observation, then because the work we'd done on Turtle Talk and uh, Laugh Lauren stuff, we felt we knew enough about technology. Because other people had tried to solve that problem earlier, couldn't. We thought we knew enough about the technology to make that work. So then it comes to your second question, which is how do you pull together a team? And what is it like, the teams at Disney? The, one of the great things about working at Disney is the quality of the other people you get to work with, right? You can be dumb as a board, but you're surrounded by these really brilliant I think people. So. If Disney <laughs> hires you, you are definitely not dumb as a board. <laughs> so, uh, well, I don't know. There are a bunch of people who made me look really good. Yeah, and you are vetted by Disney, you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, so they, they do um, have uh, either in-house access to great people, or they draw the greatest vendors and, and consultants. You know, you can mm -hmm. kind of, if you're looking for a particular skill, you'll find world-class skill that you have access to, partly because they'll, the projects are funded in such a way that you can afford them, and partly because the projects are sexy enough that people will want to work on them with you. And so sure. you get these great people. So for instance, Turtle Talk. Um, yeah, one of my favorite attractions, by the way. You worked but, on it, you were, a well, it was my idea. It was my idea. And Monsters Dot Inc. Laugh Floor. Both. Oh my gosh! Every time I walk out of those attractions, I'm in tears. Like I'm just, I laugh so much. So well, I'm glad you like them. Yeah. Yeah. So Turtle Talk was even my idea. That came out of work. Nobody's idea is completely independent because the, um, uh, you know, what's that old Newton's line? If I saw farther, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, it, it's the same way here. So R&D had been doing a piece uh, where they had invented the idea. Well, I should think it came out of a university, but they brought it in um, uh, of live puppeted computer graphic characters. Mm -hmm. uh, they had done a, a stitch mock-up at Interventions in California, which had been hugely popular. Um, or in a land company who runs the parks and owns the parks in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, their CEO saw it and fell in love with it as part of a complex of stuff. And I got asked by Joe. In the Tokyo attraction or the Tokyo? It, 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 yeah, yeah. It, so so he the original idea was we were going to build, um, we we're going to build an attraction that was to have gone into Tokyo Disney Seas Park okay. in, into the Columbia, which is the fake ship that's in the New York Harbor area. Yep, yep, I've been there. It's, yeah. Okay, excellent. So it's in the back half of the ship currently sits Turtle Talk. Yeah. Originally something else was supposed to go there. Um, and we were working on that something else and Turtle Talk was gonna be the pre-show, was something I came up with to be the pre-show of that. Mm -hmm. So now I had this idea, it, it, it died, it was too expensive. 
but we had this idea of the pre-show that we felt was strong enough. By that point, I brought in a couple of other key people. Ralph Fernandez, uh, um, probably the most key. He was a sort of a super consultant to Disney. Um, he's never been an employee, but he was my creative partner for uh, 15 years or so. And um, so uh, we worked out the detail of how that might work, uh, brought it, uh, uh, began to work with a woman named Susie Lum, who was at the time VP of Character Voices, uh, who, and so the three of us did a ton of work on that initial thing. Mo Adley was brought in, a bunch of others. One by one, we're bringing in people with, spe it, it, since Turtle Talk was a ton about voices, we needed Susie because she knew all about voices and how to cast voices and how to get them and how to write for them and all that. So she and Raul wrote probably two thirds of that attraction eventually brought in Steve Spiegel who wrote a bunch of it. Um, he's a writer at WDI and fabulous. And, and these are all people who, who knew interactivity well and understood because we were trying to build a show where the audience is the star of the show. Mm -hmm. yeah. The fun is not crushed so much as crushes interaction with the audience. And so the audience are, so we had to divide, devise a way, if you're gonna use the audience as cast members in your show, you have to cast them in a way that they can be successful, that they can be entertainers. And so how do you do that? And so we, with interactive work, you tend to design through mock-up and play test. And so we built yeah. a play test uh, facility. We, 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 we mocked up the character and then just kept, building more and more elaborate versions of that. So you did like test audiences and stuff just to make sure. Them. We, we, I think it was around 4,000 people we tested before. Wow, 4,000? Yeah, before we went to the field. Wow. And then my philosophy was always that you build a kit, a toolkit to go to the field with, but that's not the actual show. That's just all the tools to make the show. And then you create the show in the field from the bits and pieces that you've taken. Because guests' heads are in different place in the park than even in, even in a mock-up facility. In a mock-up facility, they still, they're excited. Oh, they're getting to see backstage Disney. They're gonna see the sausage made, you know, and all that stuff. And that's exciting, yeah. but their focus is a little different, mm -hmm. right? In a park, we used to joke that the guests lost 50% of their IQ when they walked through the front gate, right? But, but if you- why, why do you see that? Well, if you understand brain science, that's because that's what happens. Okay. Right? The brain focuses on, what it, on what's new and interesting and focuses away from the known, right? Yeah. And so in entertainment, generally, you try to get people surrounded by the known so they can focus on the movie screen or the TV screen, which is the mm -hmm. unknown. Or you take it out by darkness, you go into a movie theater, all the periphery is dark, right? So you just focus on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, in a theme park, it's all around you, constantly distracting you, you're looking here, you're looking there, you're looking everywhere. Yeah, the smells and the sounds, like it's a multi-sensory experience. M many more senses involved yeah. and behaviorally different, right? Awesome. Normally I go with my family and we don't go to the parks to see the shows or ride the rides. We go to the parks to have a bonding experience with people we love. And right. And the, and to use Hitchcock's term, the rides and shows are the MacGuffin mm -hmm. that drives that bonding experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that means even behaviorally, I'm focused more on my kids than I am normally. And you know, normally I don't spend all day focused on my kids. Normally my kids don't get all day focused with on my by my parents. And so even behaviorally, there's a bunch of stuff going on. So your brain's processing all this other stuff, leaves a lot less yeah. brain power to look at the shows, look at the rides. So, so you everything take all part, of that into consideration. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's hard. As a matter of fact, that was the biggest mistake we would make in the mock-ups is the, the jokes and the stories and stuff that we worked up in the mock-ups. Generally, we had to dumb them down a level when we got to the park. Okay. Even because, again, the level of focus is just not as good in the park. And so, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Especially if you're in a group, um, you know, because I've experienced going to the park by myself, but I've also gone with friends and my family, and it's it's a different experience. 
Oh yeah, as an executive, I used to go through the parks alone all the time. It's yeah, and it's so fun because you can focus more on you notice more things. You notice a ton of stuff, but it is yeah. not the typical guest experience at all. Yeah. Right. So I would make point of also taking my family through quite regularly, and we'd do the full guest experience. We wouldn't, you know, this was before Fast Pass a lot of it, but we wouldn't. But even when Fast Pass came along, I wouldn't go through Fast Pass. So we could see what the true guest experience was like, suffer along with them, you know. Because lions. <laughs> exactly. You, oh, if you're not hot and sweaty, hot you're not summer right. day in Florida. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you if your glasses don't fog up, uh, yeah. you're not truly living the life. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, it, it it's designed through mock up and play test. It's paying. You know, Marty Sklar years ago wrote what are called Mickey's 10 commandments, which are just design guidelines. Number one is know your audience. And so that's step number one. You know, the difference between interactive and traditional storytelling is who's responsible for the actions of the protagonist, right? In a story, the writer is. And so we just follow along. Mm -hmm. But in a game, the player is. And so you have to create a world where they essentially entertain themselves by going to places that you've set up to be entertaining. Right. And the, the biggest problem for that is guests are brilliant at misinterpreting what you want them to do. <laughs> so you're constantly having to try this, try that. You know, some of it comes through pure dumb luck. I, one day in, we were testing in Florida with Turtle Talk. <coughs> we had a, uh, uh, we had three props that are virtually that are hidden behind a rock on screen. And we had the animation where crush could swim behind, pick up one of the tools and come out and then do some stick with it. So number one foam finger and a pair of glasses and a bikini top. And <coughs> one day, uh, uh, because we're the seas pavilion is sanctioned by the American zoological society we have to do a certain amount of educational stuff in that show. And so one of the things is we talk about what do turtles eat. And so Crush will come out and say, um, uh, it, it, often he'll, it, there's a, I won't get into the detail of how, but he'll get a guest to ask him, thinking it's their volition, what does he eat? And then he'll say, well, I eat this green sea grass. Yeah, what do you eat? That. And, so, <laughs> <laughs> and some little boy said, I eat turtles, right? And the actor, brilliant actor, a guy named Glenn. Yeah, you have to get good talent for that because the voice actors oh, are yeah. actually, they're like comedians. They're, they seem professional. <coughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah, we did it. There's a ton of development of talent for that show. Um, yeah, I would imagine so because they, you know, you got to be spontaneous. Yeah, you know, there are two kinds of comedi stage comedians, right? They're the kinds of guys that are just and this is men and women, who are just funny to be with, right? And there are others who work out their routines very carefully and, and over long periods of time. And they'll, you know, work the clubs, you know, week after week, month after month, perfecting the exact wording of a joke, the exact timing of a joke, all that stuff. Those guys don't work in Turtle Talk. You have to have the people who are naturally funny in the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and we initially thought we could just get people who did improv, but most improv is very well worked out in advance. And so uh, it, was, it was even a subset of that. For these but at any rate, so Crush, you know, the kid says, I eat turtles. The actor had Crush dive behind the rock and then creep out and say, you know, security, somebody call security. <laughs> you know the audience went nuts and it was so we immediately wrote that into the script you know into the we have a trill hawk has a script that they have to memorize they don't actually use it it is just trains them how to behave and it's kind of method acting how to you know how to become a turtle and then and then behave the way crush should appropriately behave in those situations okay. tell me about your involvement in the attractions in Epcot, like were, which ones were you um, were you part of? Well, the very first pro thing I did for Disney uh, as a consultant was uh, I designed the load unload area for Spaceship Earth. It's still there. 
they kind of messed it up when they built it. Just the load unload area, the and, yeah, just that, that load rotates. Load. Am I using yeah. the right word? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the I designed all the the periphery around it. It's that's a pretty it's not brilliant work. work. It's just something. Yeah, that was that was built in the nineties or eighties. It was when the park opened in eighty three or eighty four. I forget. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. No. It was it was an opening day. And I came in as a consultant, designed it as a model, and then others took and, and fabricated it <coughs> and installed it. I wasn't involved in any of that. Okay. And, then, uh, and then I worked on it. And then I went away, had my own company for seven years and did work for, you know, did Hanna-Barbera post-show for Universal and did all the special effects for the Ghostbusters show at Universal. And, oh, the Ghostbusters show. That was amazing. Yeah. We did that was all such a good show. Really good. Yeah. It was fun. We had a good time with that. And we did uh, work for, for all sorts of parks, uh, Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, and I forget, just, and a lot of museums and zoos and stuff. So I, by the time I came back to Disney seven years later, I was already, I was by then pretty experienced yeah. designer and producer. And so then I came back to Disney and um, I've worked in some level on most Epcot pavilions in their rehabs because um, I wasn't there during the initial phase. Okay. Um, I did do all the special effects for the Astuter Computer Review, which was the Sperry sponsor show and Communicore went for opening day. That was an opening day show. Okay. Um, uh, and there I was working as special effects designer, which I did for a kind of a short period of time. Um, and then, you know, the last thing in Epcot I did is I redid test track so the whole design your own car thing that was all yes the test track yeah. yeah so how much leeway do they give you in terms of like um the the creative um components that go into each project do they give you like hey this is what we have in mind and do you just follow instructions or do you have some freedom uh, when it comes to the design and the user experience yeah all of the above it depends entirely on the project. I tended, because my specialty was unique and not well understood in the company, I tended to have a lot of freedom. Uh, I, my big frustration was I had a lot of ideas that never built because nobody understood what the heck I was trying to put out there, right? Um, uh, other designers, a lot of them were assigned projects. I was never assigned a project. I always found a project and then pitched it and sold it. Um, and, uh, but some of those were, no, no, well, I wouldn't have signed, I was, I was requested at times, like Turtle Talk started out with Joe Land Cicero asking me if I, because I was the interactive guy, would I work on this show for the Columbia? And then it came out of that work. And um, when I, I was technically VPO, creative VP over at Epcot, when um, the, um, uh, sponsorship agreement with for test track came up with GM so that's the reason I led that led that one and I did all of interventions for a while I did a ton of shows in invention in interventions I loved that yeah, work yes, yeah. because it was nobody cared and so I used it as my own little R&D lab <laughs> I got to I mean I, I, I each one of them I would look at I would say okay what test can we do here right so and how does that come to you? Like what, when do you get that spark of inspiration? Well, it, it, so generally when my mind is relaxed. Right? Okay. I, one of the questions you sent me was how do you, how do you, how does the creative process work and where did, what, if somebody's having a creative block, how to get over it? Yeah, and, I would imagine like you're working on all these things and creativity is not something that comes to you just at your will, you know, it, it can just come at any time. So, or is it something that you can induce? So I'm just curious to know. Both, both. For most people early in their careers, it's kind of a, uh, something that comes in uh, at random times and you just uh, use what I call the Egyptian method where you just overwhelm it with bodies, right? The way they built the pyramids. Um, you know, you just okay. keep, <laughs> you know, the Egyptian method. You said. Just because, you know, that's how they built the pyramids back then. They just had a zillion people working on it, right? Yeah, and, yeah. 
a, a zillion person hours, right? And so if you're trying to solve a creative problem, just keep banging on it and banging on it and banging on it. Eventually, if you try enough of things, something will work, right? Mm -hmm. But that can be a pretty inefficient system. Uh, yeah. Usually uh, th things that are guaranteed to help one relax your mind, right? The, some people, uh, Sue Bryan, who worked with me for years and is brilliant, she would always bring toys into a play, to, into a brainstorm, right? Because toys. Toys. And so the desk would be covered with toys and people would be playing with toys. But that gets you kind of relax and then. That's and interesting. Then that okay. works. Yeah, no, no, it was a very. Like Legos and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't matter. Uh, yeah, she'd have Legos, she'd have dolls. Uh, you know, it's weird. So you're, you're bringing out that inner kid, essentially. So. Part of it is bringing out the inner kid, but, but sometimes there were things like, um, oh, Play Doh or. Um, uh, more random stuff like uh, an etch a sketch, or you know things that that, <clears throat> or or a Rubik's cube, you know things that would just kind of take your mind off a specific problem for a moment, and then everybody around you is talking, and all of a sudden that's when your mind kind of loosened up. Will right? Will, will to me. Yeah. Creativity is kind of like jigsaw puzzling in that you're looking for a couple of things that you wouldn't think should go together, but that end up actually fitting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's the heart of innovation. <laughs> Worked at Disney too long of innovation um, and invention. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the heart of invention is generally the association of two things that you didn't think should go together but in yeah. fact do right and uh and so there was a ton of that right uh, to go back to the talking mickey we knew from turtle talk how to uh how to engineer a conversation right the the most of us in conversation have tools we use to, to manage the conversation. You know, there's certain people who will always stop, a stop for a breath in the middle of a sentence, so you can't interrupt them, right? And there are certain people who will just bull ahead and talk over the top of you. And there's, we all have tools we use to try to control a conversation. So we had to understand, we had to learn and understand how conversation works so that we could time it right to work in our show, right? That led us with an ability to understand how do you deal. When we originally started doing the mock-ups and play tests for the live talking Mickey, we simply got the guy who plays Mickey, Brad, and had him radio his voice into the, and we rehearsed the costume, person in the costume mm -hmm. with him. And so those people are almost always women because they have to be very short, right? So the woman in the costume and Mickey voice guy would, between them, work out a routine and we'd rehearse that, rehearse that, and we'd go out and test it with guests, right? Mm -hmm. And the advantage of that is you can do anything and, you know, uh, but it came down to the guest's name, right? You can, the one thing of having a live actor is you can, whatever the kid's name is, you can say it. It doesn't matter whether, if it's as simple as Joe or, you know, uh, some strange foreign name that you've never heard before in your life. It can yeah. still be, that, still, would be that would be the challenge, right? If it's like a, because yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of international guests. Yeah, my favorite name is the name of an Indian. My dad taught foreign students, uh, yeah. an Indian student of his name, Kitty Boon Kanjar at Pitpat Cool. I love that name. <laughs> Did you say that again? Because I'm, I'm of Indian origin, so I probably heard it. Okay, okay. Kitty Boon Kanjar at Pitpat Cool is the way I remember. Now I learned this as a child. But. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I, it doesn't bring a bell. Maybe if I not quite right. <laughs> <laughs> his best friend was was named Boon Kitty Charwan. Um, Boon, yeah. I don't know. I've never okay. heard of Wrong, before. wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I would imagine the character is having a tough time pronouncing those names. <laughs> and more importantly, there's no way you could put that into a database 
and have an actor find it and call it up automatically. So yeah, we had to- back then, because I don't know how even, sophisticated even, the technology was at that time. Right, but even now you'd have a hard time doing that because you couldn't, unless you could automate that and do it at computer speeds, you, a human cannot go through their own database and figure out a name that fast, right? Mm -hmm. So, and Mickey only gets one voice. There's only one person who does Mickey in the whole world, right? Because they they originally, that, that wasn't always true. Walt originally did Mickey's voice and then- Yeah, that high pitch. Yeah, and then, then and eventually there were six people, six different people doing Mickey's voice mm -hmm. and audiences were saying, hey, his voice keeps changing, this is wrong. So in way back in the 50s, they had a contest. Uh, Wayne Allwine, who was a special effects guy, won and then he was the official voice of Mickey for decades until he passed away and then new guy came along. So at any rate, so there's no way we can train an actor in the costume to be the voice. And while you can technologically pitch shift a voice into the correct place, it actually turns out, and that's what the early research all tried to do, turns out that doesn't work. It's all about performance, really. <clears throat> it's about the pacing of the words, the <laughs> phrasing of the words. That's as much as the voice, that's what makes Mickey sound like Mickey. And so we knew we were gonna have to voice Mickey by using pre-recorded dialogue. Well, for we one of one of the projects I did years ago was Pal Mickey, a little portable Mickey. I don't know if you ever saw that. He Where was, was it exactly? In in the Florida parks, he, you would buy him in the Florida parks. You could carry him around, and he knew where he was in the parks by some technology, okay. and then we talk about what he saw based upon where he was. Okay. Yeah. He was an incredibly popular toy at the time. The only thing that sold better than Pal Mickey at the time was ponchos. <laughs> this is <laughs> rainy in Florida. <laughs> Definitely purchased those a couple of times. <laughs> you might have. Uh, at any rate, so uh, so we uh, to do Pal Mickey way back then, we had had, and that was Ral and I, had to do a ton of work with concatenation. Concatenation is assembling a single sentence from a bunch of different pieces. Okay. So, hey, how are you today might be stored as, hey, how are you and today? And so then you can, hey, how are you today? Hey, where have you been today? Hey, where are you going today? Hey, where have you been? Uh, where have you been since dinner? You know, you can, you can, you know, oh my gosh, where have you been today? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can piece those together as long as the reads are right and they flow, right? <clears throat> but, it, but Pal Mickey had very limited storage space. So we we ended up doing a ton of concatenation and learned about doing all of that. So that built into part of how we do this. The second was all the stuff we learned at Turtle Talk about how to control the flow of a conversation. And then we also did the um, uh, the Roz character at the end of the ride here in, Cal the Monsters ride here in California, which is lightly interactive, right? Yeah. And she would pop up every few minutes. I remember that. Yeah, right. And she, it depends on, and that is controlled by a cast member backstage just pushing buttons and triggering lines of dialogue. They're context related. So the, the, uh, the cast member is looking at a camera, watching the guests who are coming, and he'll or she'll tap a button and say, okay, th this seat has <clears throat> little boy, little girl. This bench, because they're paired, has mom, daughter, father, daughter, looks so like. They kind of scan the audience just to. Yeah, the, 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 because we were using cast members and not actors. Yeah. We felt we could trust them to make observations. We couldn't trust them to be entertaining. Okay. So they would just make observations. Mother, father, guy in hat, uh, girl wearing a happy birthday button, those kinds of things. And then Roz would make comments based upon those contexts. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And, but sometimes she'd, if the car stopped in front of her, she'd run out of things to say. And then what were we going to do? Oh my goodness. You know, you can't start repeating that gives away the gag. Right. Yeah. So we came up with this idea of what we call the get out, get away or escape line. Right. And with Roz, it was real easy when she gets into a position where, where, she doesn't know what to do. She goes, ah, whatever. 
and goes back and starts writing on her thing because that's so like a filler basically yeah exactly but that's <laughs> in character way to get out of a yeah out of a conversation jam right it's right. like at the cocktail party i wish i had that line when i get in an awkward yeah. situation right so we learned that there are a bunch of those and we developed those for mickey for the live voice mickey so that we could have right. deep conversations but if we got into trouble but Rot, Mickey can't say, ah, oh, whatever. He's That's not correct for him. So he had to find other ways to escape. Find other ways, that. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's, a, obviously you put a lot of thought into the whole workflow and how, and the whole technical aspect of it. But mm -hmm. what do you, what is your thought process like when it comes to the human element? Like, what do you want um, visitors, like, what do you want them to feel, experience, and learn by, uh, you know, by going through all these interactive experiences? Like, what do you want them to get out of it? Well, it all goes back, it, you know, there's that famous um, interview with Walt called Daddy's Day, do you know this one? Where he talks about, uh, you, Google it, you can find it, it's called what, Daddy. Okay, yeah, what does he say in it? Because I think I've seen most of his interviews. I can't imagine I haven't. Um, he's, he's talking about, he'd gone, he'd taken his daughters to Griffith Park. And he says, I put them on the carousel and I, they went around in a circle and I sat on a bench. And then I put on the pony rides and they went around in a circle and I sat on the bench. And finally said, this is wrong. I should be doing something with my children. Right? Yeah. And that's the core for everything Disney. And so we always want to do the same thing with, with what we're doing. We want to drive people together, right? And so um, when we do something like Turtle Talk, we're trying to get people to link, not just with the turtle, but with each other. <coughs> and to feel empowerment from that. We, we do, in Monsters, Inc., we do a certain amount of... Um, uh, um, ragging, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, uh, we do it a little bit. I was a victim in one of those times, but anyway. Yeah, there, there are there are two classes of victims that we allow. Yeah. Right? Um, one is sort of sweet looking big guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because uh, one of the one of the characters, one of the two headed characters, they go through a thing about what's scary in the world. And one of them says, that guy. And so he becomes that guy and he's shown on the video screen. And so that it's, because there's kind of a rule in American culture that it's okay to pick on dad, right? Dad is presumed to naturally be tough enough to handle it. So though there was a lot of learning, man, the actors initially, they, they pick really scary people, you know, like bikers and stuff. <laughs> It was to a lot. It was like, ah. <laughs> you know, that, yeah, that guy is scary, and that guy was at Disney, and he didn't want to be viewed as scary that day. It was horrible. We had, we really had to work the actors. No, you you want somebody who is definitely not scary to be that guy, right? Yeah. Sure. The other, and this is why you got picked on. The other is a pretty girl, right? Uh, usually with a child. Were you with a child at the time? No. I was by myself. <laughs> That's actually shouldn't have happened. It should. It's usually a mother and daughter. Maybe they assumed I was with somebody. You know, because they, they could have because a lot because a lot of it. But they'll. But then they do the whole thing where they make you do the antennas and stuff like that. Is that the one they did? The gag they did. No. Usually, not a oh, okay. Well, usually it's a guy named Buddy Buddy Boyle, um, who could all who can also be Betty Boyle. Um, the actor we we designed it so male or female actors could one of the problems with turtle talk was it only could be guys who did the could do the we never found a woman who could do the voice and that became a sexist and be kind of operationally just harder to do right so when we started doing working on laugh floor we went to pixar and said hey can we can you help us design our own characters or design custom design characters for, for us that we can make be either male or female? And they went, oh yeah, sure, that was great. <clears throat> and so we designed all those characters so that they can be either male or female. And that allows us to use whichever actor. So Buddy Boyle can become Betty Boyle. Uh, if, if you push the Betty button, then she gets lipstick and a bow and not if it's Buddy, right? Okay. Um, but, but so Buddy is, 
you know, uh, king of malapropisms and um, thinks he's smart, but, you know, makes, he's a monster to really understand humans. And So you give all of these characters a personality. You think about all of them. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, so the shows are designed around emotions. The show is designed through an emotional, emotional arc we, we want to choreograph you through an emotional arc. If you look at the, so the, the characters are all controlled a little bit by joysticks, but, and, uh, but mostly through button arrays. Okay. And those button Water arrays. Alert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and those button arrays are all arranged around emotional states. Okay. So we choreograph you through emotional states. And that's key because that's what we want you to do is go through an emotional story, an emotional adventure. That's what builds the emotion that then bonds you to your friend or child or parent or whoever you're with. Right? And okay. So that's what that's all about. And how do they keep the energy going? Because I would imagine that they get fatigued doing this so many times during a day and then doing it again the next day. How do they keep Oh, it? it can be, yeah, there's a, well, it's really interesting. Um, we discovered fairly early that there are kind of two categories of actors, those that have long, a lot of durability and those that don't. <laughs> and the, and the, the short-term ones burn out pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, but, but like Glenn Panic has been doing that, doing Turtle Talk, I think. I think he's still doing it, and he 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 was one he, he was two actors. He uh, and James, um, great, I'm trying to get James' last name. They were brilliant. At any rate, the two of them were the two actors who helped us. That we had seven actors to open the show, mm -hmm. uh, and those two were the two real inventors in the group, and so they helped us proof the show they came up with lines they helped us work on timing of lines and James Keaton and the 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 things they were that they really taught us the most about was how to recognize who to talk to in an audience right because if you pick the wrong child they'll just shut up and and that's no there's no fun in a in a child that doesn't interact right well how can um, they tell because you know uh, well it's it's all about you know we've got the rooms are full of cameras so we're watching the audience very carefully wow. so they, yeah oh no there i've been accused of big brother and creepy factor and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, i don't know how to do the show otherwise right but yeah but that's essential right in creating the right experience it, it is it absolutely is so when the doors open the actors are immediately watching the guests who are coming in in turtle talk they're watching the children in uh yeah yeah <laughs> kids have a big play a big part in that show. Right, it, it, in Turtle Talk, it's all about, uh, it, 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 it's about children. Now, a lot of people mistake and think it's about really little children, it's not. It actually works best 10, 11 and 12 year olds. The kids yeah. who, are, who are a little bit snotty are much more fun than ones that yeah. are. But I don't know, Disney seems to, you know, when you look at it on the, on the, the park guide, they seem, they position it as, a children's attraction and that's why I avoided it for the longest time but I tried it out once I tried it out I said this is actually a lot of fun you know this is it, especially if you get a good actor and yeah yeah and, and it the marketing people don't even our actors often get it wrong they don't understand that it actually a it works better if it's aged up a little bit if if you're if an actor picks a little tiny child they may be the most adorable child in the world, but they'll freeze and then that kills the energy of the show, yeah. right? You want, to, you, you want them really no, no younger than eight and probably, and if you get to the point, well, I, I'll give you an example. So when the, um, this all started with, as I said, with, an, with a, a stitch phone booth that was done in Interventions here in California, R and D put that together. And uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? The stitch. St it, it, what was it called? It was anyway. It was a stitch phone booth. I don't know. I don't remember the official name for it. Are you Are you talking about the stitch encounter? Uh, that's in no, That's in no. Disneyland. Uh, that's in Tokyo Disneyland. We originally. Okay. Stitch encounter we built after Turtle Talk. 
yeah. um, for Hong Kong originally. And then we propagated it to Paris and then it, it died in Hong Kong for reasons I won't get into, but uh, then we put it into Shanghai and into Tokyo more recently, right? Mm -hmm. or I'm been, pretty sure I, it's there in Florida too. I, I have been there, yeah. I don't, they, okay, no, 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 you're thinking of Stitch Escape. Yeah. That's Stitch okay. Escape, I'm sorry, yeah, Stitch Escape. Oh yeah, no, that's a completely different, completely okay. different show. Yeah. No, Stitch Encounter is, is a Turtle Talk type show with a- Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and yeah, so it's, but there was an, the original live puppet character that went into the parks was a stitch phone booth that was on the second floor of Interventions, you know, the old circle of uh, mm -hmm. carousel building in Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And in it, you purported, it purportedly had a, there was a giant video phone and you had a call to Stitch who was in Hawaii. And it went over like crazy. It was a, 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 an experiment put together by R&D. It was supposed to last two weeks. I think it lasted four years. Ops would not let them take it out, uh, and it was driving them nuts trying to keep it maintained. And it didn't have any capacity. It was one actor with at most one family. It was just uh, the economics of it didn't work very well. So they, uh, and by then I had developed the idea of Turtle Talk for Tokyo. We'll, we'll not get into the detail of that, but at any rate, the bottom line was in it there was a moment in the video captures of guests when they were learning where I guess a family had come in with younger child that had a great time. They kept telling their older child who was 11, 12, 13 maybe, and his friend to go in it. And they came in and their arms were crossed and like they were too cool for this kid stuff. They weren't gonna have anything to do with it. And <clears throat> guy named Flip who was doing the voice in those days uh, <clears throat> tried to engage him and they were you know being they were standing way at the back of the booth and just skeptical as could be and he said well I've got a secret I want to tell you but you got to come close to the screen they take a step no close to the screen they take it no I'm not going to tell you if you don't come you got to come right up the screen finally the two kids walk right up the screen and Stitch lets out this enormous belch. <laughs> <laughs> These two boys, too cool for school, right? They just fall on the floor laughing. They think it's the funniest thing because completely didn't expect it, right? And then he had them and then they had a great time. That's just brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. And <laughs> Do you take culture into consideration because you're building these attractions in different parts of the world? So do you adapt? <laughs> The attractions based on some of the cultural norms and the behavior absolutely yeah the uh, <clears throat> so when we did the first one we did overseas was the stitch encounter right right and like i say it's a turtle talk type show but with stitch it's we they originally wanted to just take turtle talk to hong kong but the only space they had was a place that was going to be an arcade under space mountain and we convinced them that turtles in space didn't make a lot of sense <laughs> so they gave me some extra money and then we got to do stitch um, yeah. uh, and so we hired a mandarin writer we hired a cantonese writer um, uh, and we had our english writing crew right and so we initially built and tested here in the u.s we had a a mock-up theater here and we would go into the Chinese American community and go to Chinese churches and Chinese schools and stuff like that Chinese American schools and ask them to send us people who are the most recent emigres they could find and then we would play test with them it sort of worked <laughs> even the most recent emigres even ones who didn't speak English still were way more westernized than the local audience, especially the, uh, the Mandarin speakers. The Cantonese audience, largely from Hong Kong and nearby, were more westernized than the Putin speakers from other areas of China, right? And so uh, we essentially ended up ha having to write three shows, an English show, a Cantonese show, and a 
uh, Mandarin show yeah. because their senses of humor are different. Exactly. And the I, nuance, there are nuances, right, that you have to take into consideration when writing those scripts. Some of it's nuance and some of it's just way different. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, well, in Japan, for instance, uh, so we also did Turtle Talk in Tokyo, right? And we did st and the stitch shows in Tokyo too, and in France. And on huge cruise ships. At any rate, um, so when we took Turtle Talk to Tokyo, we already had two working facilities of it here in the US, one in Florida, one in California, right? So we got Japanese, some Japanese speakers to, to as writers, right? And we went there. But every culture has its own mythologies uh, and its own self-perception, right? So, and you, and you never know how much they're telling themselves the truth and how much they're lying to themselves. It can be tricky. And so you write, so some of it, some of it is just different humor. Like any pun in English isn't going to work in Japanese. I mean, the odds are 99% that won't because puns don't translate. They're based yeah. on sound, right? <laughs> um, but visual side gag jokes tend to work across culture. But some cultural stuff doesn't, right? So the turtle, so Crush is a surfer dude in the American version of the movie. But surfers in Japan are considered kind of like bikers. They're not considered to be cool. They're considered right, to be right. kind of slimy people. And so uh, when the movie was adapted for the Japanese, they modified that so that it would be um, uh, different. And he, he became kind of a wise old man. Japanese culture has the turtle as this wise old man who will do oh, the drawing, right? naturally, right? That's yeah. part of the reason they pushed him in that direction. Yeah. So we would have, it happen, it's happened a number of times where a Japanese, a pregnant Japanese woman will come into the show and if she gets called on, she will ask Crush to name her baby. How do you make a joke out of that? <laughs> very tough and in fact the first time it happened the Japanese actor who did it I mean he understood the situation but he, not knowing how to react he kind of made a funny joke and, and moved on right woman came around and asked him again <laughs> she was not taking no for an answer right? and so then there's a whole bunch of work backstage we to, I mean... <laughs> yeah, well we had to do a bunch of work to try to figure out how to how to not name her baby and yet handle her in a, in a culturally sensitive way. And I don't remember the detail of how that's solved anymore, but we did solve that one or the, yeah. the, the writers did. Yeah. I, you know, with the Tower of Terror attraction in Japan, they actually changed the whole, um, the storyline. It's not based on the TV show or the movie. No, it's not at all. It's, yeah. it's a, a character named Harrison Hightower who is visually modeled after Joe Rohde. Yeah. And uh, and he supposedly collected all sorts of things, including some things. Right. Yes. That, that's what that it was. Were, yes. That were cursed. Yeah. 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 That's because Twilight Zone never played in Japan. So they, that audience had no yeah. no way of knowing it. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I just want to ask you about one more attraction. You said you were involved with Spaceship Earth, right? Were you only, did you only do the, the turnstile or were you, did you actually get involved with the building of the attraction? I ask because it's one of my favorite. It is honestly one of my favorite favorites. So we divide, we divide that building into several parts. Right. right. There's the load on load area. There's the, what we call the up ramp, okay. the down ramp and the post show. When the place opened, there wasn't a regular post show. It was World Key Information Service, where they had uh, video screens, connect touch screen, early early touch screen monitors. Nobody had seen them before. And then there was a bank of operators back, and you could talk to an operator and make reservations for dinner and learn about stuff. That became rather passe after a few years, and so uh, we went through and did a rehab and made the post show to Spaceship Earth. And I did that originally, working with a guy named Larry Gertz. He upgraded the the last several um, scenes in the up ramp and then he redid the down ramp scenes because that they had gotten out that that was also supposed to be current and they had gotten old right uh, and then I built the post show interactives for that and then 10 years later again um, when AT&T sponsorship came up again 
we rehabbed it again. And that time I did the whole down ramp and the post show. So I added the interactivity in the cars and then all the, and then we put in a whole new set of interactives. Yeah, they changed that recently, right? I mean, they've, uh, now they have Judy Dench voicing it and they have a completely um, a fun experience. It's, it's actually an interactive exercise where they ask you, uh, where would you like to live in the future, in the, in, in the future? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, did it, you design that? No, 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 I did not do, well, wait. I don't, I haven't been back to the park in, in since 2014, 2013. So it's been a while since I've been back. So I don't know. I, the down ramp that was interactive, I did that work here. Okay. Where they, where they asked what kind of future, was it Judy Dench? Yeah, it was Judy, Judy Dench. Pretty, pretty sure it was. Yeah, okay. it is. I mean, that's the if, voice. If it's still the one that I, I, I did all the down ramp stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, my line producer was a guy named Ken Neville. And um, uh, if there's been something more recent, there could have been, I don't know. But yeah. I, that sounds like what I did. And then there were a whole bunch of attractions in, you know, where you'd, um, there was a sort of a game you'd play on the floor with kind of like a yeah, hot stick and uh, another one where you'd, you'd uh, like a visible human, you'd be taking body parts in and out and he'd talk to you while you're doing that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, we did all that work, yeah. Okay, that's just, just as brilliant, it's just brilliant. Um, okay, Joe, one last question. What advice do you have for the creative people out there? Well, everyone's creative, but for those who are in fields that require a lot of creativity, what advice do you have for them if they wanna get a surge of inspiration or if they, or if they feel like they're stuck in a creative rut? What do you, what do you suggest? It goes back to something I said earlier. It's about relaxation. Mm -hmm. Try to do something to relax your mind and get away from it for a minute. When you've done it a ton for years, you can kind of automatically enter that zone and it doesn't matter whether you're under pressure or not, you can go there. But it's a tra that's training, right? So mm -hmm. in, for most of us, when we get bound up, it's because we're putting too much pressure on ourselves. And the best way to do is relax. Um, you don't want to stop thinking about it, but I often go for a drive or, you know, I had a friend who said, hey, all these good ideas came out of when he was taking the shower. I get a lot of my ideas when I wake up in the middle of the night, just stare at the ceiling. Do you jot them down in a diary or like do you do drawings? Like what? Uh, what I tend to uh, either type them into my, I keep my cell phone by the bed and I tend to type them into the cell phone or use the voice thing and record them into the phone. Yeah, it, it, it kind of depends. I when we came up with the idea of the talking Mickey and how to do that, I was actually driving back from vacation at Zion. I was somewhere in the desert between St. George and Las Vegas. And um, I think I had my, my wife write down the keyword so I wouldn't forget it. You know, it's, again, to me, creativity is about an observation. Um, what's not working? What's not doing what you want it to do. Um, the live vo voice, uh, uh, Enchanted Tales with Belle, that came from something I started, right? And that came from me walking into a room, seeing a sketch on the wall. Somebody was designing get character meet and greet places. And the sketch showed a princess writing an autograph. And I thought, well, that's got to be the least interesting thing you can do with a princess, right? And I didn't mean it in a dirty way, it's just like, you know, and it turns out they've been actually doing tests in Florida where they've been doing uh, early morning, you know, they had a name for it, but where uh, hotel guests. Storytelling? Storytelling? No, it was, it was early magic hours, I think is what it was called. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, early magic hours, yeah. And they were flooding certain sections of the park with characters, so that, and, and then you could do, you know, jump rope with the prince with two princesses, and you could play hopscotch with Goofy and stuff like that. And it just was nuts. Guests loved it, right? And so the question, is, and, and so again, what's wrong with this picture? Why do we have a silent Mickey in the 20th century? Why is signing an autograph with a character more fun than interacting in a deeper way? That led to Enchanted Tales with Bill, right? Well, if if it's fun 
to go to a move to, to run into, you know, a movie star in a restaurant for an adult, who are the movie stars for kids? They're cartoon characters. I want to have the same kind of robust interaction with a cartoon character as you have with, you know, Beyonce and if you ran into her in a restaurant. <laughs> that was the turtle yep. talk, right? So it's it's it, again, it's a lot of it's like, what's wrong with this picture? And then figure out a way to make it right. So you see a problem and then you get into this that kind of jump starts your to me it's always about an observation some usually the observation is something that's either a problem or odd companies and cultures get into these loops where they um tell themselves lies and you have to kind of figure out oh that's really not how the world works or should work how can i make it better again turtle talk why do we have to take, why do car, I mean, the first walk around character from Pixar, from um, Finding Nemo mm -hmm. was a Nemo on a piece of coral, a physical sculpture that it could wag its tail and wag its head and, and was voiced by somebody standing. And it was the dumbest thing in the world. This <laughs> piece of coral with a fish driving around. It was just like, oh, that's horrible, right? You, how young do you have to be to, to believe that, right? So let's make something that works better and bigger. Right, right. And I know one of the uh, Walt Disney's biggest values was curiosity. He was always curious, always questioning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and is that something that influences you too? Oh yeah, I drive my wife nuts. <laughs> I mean, we've got a hummingbird in the backyard here, uh, built a nest and is raising babies. And so for lunch today, I, was, I had gone and researched how long is the jet, how long is she going to be sitting on that nest? And does hubby share the duties? Turns out they don't. Um, and then how long, you know, I was just, so she got the, the, the deep download on hummingbirds for lunch, right? So <laughs> I'm sure I bored her to death. <laughs> yeah, so it's really important yeah, to, no, I, and to really, you know, see the world through a child's eyes because it seems like you, you do that. I, Yes, I, some level, I guess, is that. But I yeah. think the main thing is just, it, it, it's remaining curious, but it's also not denying the value of your curiosity. When mm -hmm. I was coming up through the company and through the industry, a lot of people were studying this, that, and the other very hard. AA guys were looking at AA figures and robotics and, and story guys were learning how to, you know, all the details of a story. And I was reading anthropology books and natural history books and, you know, the anatomy of a butterfly and all sorts of stuff that didn't seem to make any sense. And yet later on, it all comes together and becomes part of m my ability to, to present a different and a more unique vision, right? I think there's an awful lot of creatives and a lot of, especially young people starting out in the industry who feel like they have to do what everybody else is doing. Don't feel like don't follow your interests, whatever they are. Eventually it will come together as a unique perspective and that unique perspective will have more value than knowing what everybody else knows. That's, that's just lovely. That's such a great way to end our conversation. Joe, I mean, I could talk to you all day, but I think we better end the conversation here. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, some, some, some people have lives they actually have to live. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been so wonderful talking to you, uh, Joe. How do people find you if they if they want to know more about you? Do you have a website or social media handles where they can? I don't. Get in touch with you? That's fine. I mean, if I think, you know, if they could learn more about Imagineering and you know the thought process that goes behind behind all of those attractions, like where can they learn more about that? Do you, can you suggest any resources? Um, you know, there's not a lot of books. There uh, th there are a few. I. The ones I've never read all of them, and I have I have been a little the pieces and bits that I've seen I haven't liked a lot. Um, Kevin Rafferty has a new book out, um, and I love Kevin; he's fabulous. Don Carson, Don Carson, and he is an illustrator who's worked in the industry and other industries for a long, long time. Yeah. Brilliant, and he has a huge catalog. He publishes one a week, I think, going back now a decade or two um, <clears throat> of advice how to design things. Okay. And 
they're brilliant. And uh, that would be as good a place as any to start. He's fabulous and, and, and full of knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll make sure I'll add that to the description as a resource for everybody. Uh, perfect. Thanks again, Joe. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Well, you too. And thanks. It was a, a, it was a joy talking to you. So. Yeah, it was so much fun. So much fun. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye.